I'm Ida Volk. You're about to see an interview I recorded with Noam Chomsky. But before we begin, I want to provide some context on why we're running this interview. I don't agree with a lot of what Noam Chomsky says here. However, it's important to recognise the points of view he puts forward. These are influential and widespread views, and Chomsky is one of their preeminent advocates. In the interview, Noam Chomsky says the US wants to keep the war in Ukraine going to weaken Russia. This analysis gives no agency to Ukraine, portraying it as a pawn of the US. He says that Finland and Sweden applied to join NATO to gain new market opportunities for their weapons, which ignores that they ended decades of neutrality just months after the invasion of Ukraine. His view of Taiwan is one-sided, blaming the US but ignoring China's undermining of the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. I've written this interview up for the New Statesman and the link is in the description, so you can read more there. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Mr Chomsky. Um, You've got this fascinating book of interviews uh, just published. It ranges over a period of of about a year from 2021 to 2022, obviously a pivotal period in, um, in the history of of the world, um, particularly because of the the invasion of Ukraine. And that's that's where I want to start. The second chapter is titled Biden's foreign policy is largely largely indistinguishable from Trump's. And it's from 2021. And I think maybe one thing that the invasion of Ukraine shows is that I think Biden approached this crisis quite differently to Trump. Um, Do you share that assessment? It's very hard to say because Trump is a loose cannon. You have no idea what his policy was. So one moment he says, we have to work something out with Russia. The next moment he says, we have to keep the Bagram air base in uh, Afghanistan for a base for attacking Russia. Who knows what his policy is? It's whatever he saw on Fox News this morning. So you can't compare Biden's policy with Trump's. Biden's policy is pretty clear, very explicit, it's been stated. We must continue the war in order to severely weaken Russia. That's the policy. Same as Britain, which follows along. So when there were uh, some possibilities of negotiations uh, a year ago, last March, April, uh, both Britain and the United States informed Kiev that they did not regard this as a good time for negotiations. And the US policy continues to be to, um, as they put it formally, uh, to strengthen Ukraine's position so that it'll be in a better position for negotiations. In other words, no negotiations, no diplomacy. There's no, nobody explains how uh, continuing the war with battering Ukraine is going to put them in a better position. That's just uh, presupposed somehow. You can see uh, the same in the uh, uh, the international relations literature. So take a look at the last issue of Foreign Affairs. The, major uh, international affairs journal article by two leading commentators saying exactly what I just said. I have to continue the war to put Ukraine in a stronger position for eventual negotiations. How that's going to happen is some miracle unexplained. Meanwhile, Ukraine's getting battered, devastated. I have to say then every by now even military commentators are pointing out that for the United States, this is a bargain uh, for a fraction of the colossal military budget. The United States is able to severely degrade the military forces of its own, its only real military adversary. Well, whether that's the reason or not, I don't know. You can ask yourself, but those are the facts. Is it wrong for the US to provide weapons to Ukraine so that they can continue the fight as long as they wish and join negotiations when they so decide? I think it's reasonable to uh, provide weapons to Ukraine to defend itself against aggression. 
But uh, the United States has a position. Is the U.S. going to insist that there be no negotiations so that we can severely weaken Russia? But don't forget, Ukraine is not a free actor in this. They're dependent on what the United States determines. In several of the interviews, uh, you warn of the risk of nuclear war. Um, for instance, you warn that if the U.S. continues delivering weapons to Ukraine, um, the it's it's. I think you said it's easy to see, to to foresee a path to escalation that ends with nuclear war. Clearly, over the past year, uh, that's not what we've seen. We've seen weapons continually ramp up. Um, for example, the HIMARS systems that the US provided, and most recently, of course, these tank systems. Um, are you still worried about the risk of nuclear war? Anyone who has a gray cell functioning should be worried about the risk of nuclear war. Uh, that's why the uh, doomsday clock was set to 90 seconds to midnight. Uh, there are many possible scenarios that could lead to nuclear war, both in uh, Ukraine and also in China, with regard to China. For example, Ukraine, if, let's imagine that the prognostications of uh, U.S. political leaders are correct. Suppose it turns out that Ukraine can come close to defeating Russia. Is, is Putin just going to pack up his bags and say, well, that was nice, so I'll go home to oblivion? Or will he raise the uh, uh, attack against Ukraine? And notice, uh, let me ask you a simple question. When the United States and Britain were smashing Baghdad to pieces, did any foreign leaders go to visit Baghdad? No, because when the U.S. and Britain go to war, they go for the jugular. They destroy everything, communications, transportation, energy, shock and awe, anything that makes society function. That hasn't happened in Ukraine. Undoubtedly, Russia could do it, presumably with conventional weapons. Could make Kiev as unlivable as Baghdad was. Could move into attacking supply lines in Western Ukraine could be a confrontation with NATO. Then what happens? Well, just another step up the escalation ladder. And uh, once you start on that, nobody knows where it leads. So to be, to fail to be considered concerned about nuclear war is to be out of your mind. Are you implying that Russia is fighting more humanely than the US and UK were in Iraq? I'm not implying it, it's obvious. Uh, just take what I just asked. Did anybody go, did, did you remember foreign leaders going to Baghdad? In fact, they had to withdraw everybody, withdraw the UN inspectors, withdraw a peace delegation that was on the ground because the attack was so um, severe and extreme. That's the US-British style of war. Uh, take a look at casualties. Uh, all I know is the official numbers. Maybe you know more. So the official UN numbers are about 8,000 civilian casualties. How many civilian casualties were there when the US and Britain attacked Iraq? And that's only one case. How many civilian casualties were there when Israel invaded Lebanon? About 20,000. Well, ask yourself the question. What kind of a settlement would be acceptable in Ukraine? Uh, what kind of final outcome should the Ukrainians, uh, obviously Ukraine's Western backers, push for? Well, the obvious answer is the Minsk agreement, Minsk II, which offered a plausible settlement. First of all, Ukraine would not be a member of NATO. That's the red line that every Russian leader has insisted on since Yeltsin and Gorbachev. It's well known to US and British analysts and the diplomatic corps 
have all been warning Washington for 30 years that pressing this will be reckless and dangerous. That's nothing new. So point one, Ukraine uh, gains the status of, say, Austria during the Cold War or Mexico today. Mexico can't join a hostile military alliance. There's no treaty about it, but it's perfectly obvious. So that's point one. With regard to Donbass, the Minsk, Minsk agreements called for a degree of autonomy for Donbass within a Ukrainian federation. So maybe something like Switzerland or Belgium or other federated systems. With regard to Crimea, it said we put it off for the moment. Let it be discussed later. Those are the basic outlines of a solution under the Minsk II agreement, which incidentally is uh, endorsed by the UN Security Council, US and British Britain agreeing. Uh, so would, would Ukraine agree to that? Would Russia agree to that? It's only one way to find out, try. In fact, if you look at the uh, official records, as late as February, last February 2022, a couple weeks before the invasion, uh, the Russians were, didn't actually advocate it, but they mentioned uh, Minsk as a possible outcome. So is it possible? We don't know. As long as you insist on not trying, can't find out. If the invasion of Ukraine were prompted by, was, was triggered by Ukraine moving towards NATO, would Russia not have attacked Finland, which has just joined NATO and announced its intention to join NATO about uh, around a year ago, around the time of the invasion of Ukraine? There has never been the slightest indication of any Russian concern about Sweden and Finland. The reasons for Swindland, Sweden and Finland moving to join NATO have nothing to do with fear of a Russian attack, which has never been even conceived. There's a very simple reason why Finland and Sweden want to join NATO. Sweden and Finland both have quite sophisticated advanced military industries. They've been pretty much integrated into NATO with joint operations and so on. Uh, joining NATO directly gives them great new market opportunities, new access to advanced equipment and so on. But there has never been any indication except for Western uh, propaganda about Russian threats to Finland and Sweden. And it's if you think about it, it's just inconceivable. I mean, recall George Orwell's concept of doublethink, the ability to have two contradictory ideas in mind and believe them both. That's NATO right now. Uh, on the one hand, they're gloating over the fact that the Russian military is so incompetent that they can't conquer towns uh, 20 kilometers from the border. On the other hand, they're uh, wailing in fear about the idea that the new Peter the Great is going to conquer Europe. I mean, it's why the whole global south is looking at the US and Britain and collapsing in ridicule. Is there not a difference between Russia's intentions and Russia's capabilities. Um, I mean, its intentions were, I think, quite clearly to conquer most of Ukraine and its capabilities were uh, somewhat far below that, uh, that objective. You should certainly look both at intentions and capabilities. Both are clear. The capabilities have become very clear during the failure of the Russian attempts in Ukraine. That's what Western analysts are gloating about, totally incompetent military, and that's the capabilities. What are the intentions? We have about 30 years of a documentary record on intentions. The intentions begin with Gorbachev. 
He had an arrangement, a, an agreement, a firm, unambiguous agreement with President Bush, first Bush. Been a lot of deceit about this, so I suggest you look at the documents which are available online at the National Security Archive, unambiguous, clear promise by President Bush that if Gorbachev agreed to allow Germany to be unified and join NATO, which is quite a concession in the light of history, if he agreed to that, NATO would not move one inch to the east of Germany firm, explicit, unambiguous promise. Well, uh, Bill Clinton came into the presidency. After a year or two, he violated it. He said, we're going to bring in uh, uh, former Russian satellites uh, to the Russian border into NATO. He explained to his friend Yeltsin why he was doing this. It's a document. He said to Yeltsin, don't take it too seriously. I just have to do it for domestic political reasons. I need the Polish vote. Uh, I need the Eastern European vote. So we'll carry this meaningless act out. Well, the Russians tolerated that, but they made it very clear early on, all of them, that uh, Georgia and Ukraine were red lines right in the Russian geostrategic heartland. No Russian leader, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, anyone would accept them joining a foreign hostile military alliance. Practically the whole top US diplomatic corps with any knowledge of Russia has been warning for 30 years, warning Washington that it is reckless and dangerous to try to cross this red line of uh, Clinton's Secretary of Defense, William Perry, was so furious he practically resigned when Clinton broke the promise. Uh, hawks and doves, all of them, Robert Gates, the hawkish defense minister of Bush the II, uh, William Burns, head of the CIA, it's virtually unanimous, warning Washington that this is extremely dangerous. Nobody ever mentioned Finland and Norway because it was never even an issue. The only issue was Ukraine and Georgia. So we know about the intentions. And as I say, we, there's a record right up to the invasion of uh, Russian proposals, which are no, you, no NATO membership and some kind of arrangement about the Donbass region. Exactly what? could only find out with negotiations, which the US and British or Britain refuse. So that's the, we have very good evidence about intentions, have very good evidence about capabilities. We can therefore, we have two options. We can draw the rational conclusion, or we can follow the party line as dictated by uh, Washington and London. Those are the choices. You've been clear about your opposition to uh, to, to NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia. Um, but nonetheless, uh, NATO membership is very popular among Ukrainians and Georgians. I think polls show overwhelming support for joining. Why is uh, NATO membership so popular among these people, even if, uh, according to you, it's not in the interest of their countries to join? It's not me. It's repeat. The head of the CIA, virtually the entire diplomatic corps, uh, the uh, former head of the CIA, Robert Gates, Paul Nitze, Hawks, Hawks and Doves, have all been saying for 30 years that it is reckless and dangerous to try to cross this clear red line. And you understand that perfectly well. Suppose that Mexico decided to join a Chinese-run international military alliance and to get heavy weapons from China aimed at the United States, move for interoperability of Chinese and Mexican military forces. 
What do you think the United States would do? Well, we don't have to ask because Mexico would be blown away as, as soon as the first step towards this began. Well, it's much more serious in the case of Russia. The United States has not been invaded twice in the last century and virtually destroyed through Ukraine. There's a parallel to perhaps what's happening in Ukraine in Taiwan, which China has threatened to invade, to reunify by force if necessary. Would it be right for the United States and other Western countries to defend Taiwan in case of an invasion? Well, first of all, let's go back to the facts about Taiwan instead of the American-British propaganda line. Uh, what has happened in Taiwan, there has been a, an agreement for 50 years. The United States and China agreed back in the 70s on what's called a one China policy. If you look at the propaganda line now, it says it's a Chinese policy. It's not. It's a Chinese American policy. You can read the documents, very explicit. The agreement is Taiwan is part of China and neither side will take measures to disrupt the peaceful arrangements held for 50 years, which is pretty good in international affairs. The United States has been severely provoking China. So far they have reacted only symbolically. Here that's described as Chinese aggression. But take a look at the facts. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, went to visit uh, Taiwan changes the diplomatic status. Now the Kevin McCarthy is doing it. The United States uh, Senate Foreign Relations Com Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee uh, passed a Taiwan Policy Act, calling for Taiwan to have the same diplomatic status as any non-NATO member. Uh, more weapon supplies, interoperability of weapons, pretty much the same steps that were taken by the Biden administration in the years prior to the invasion of Ukraine to move towards integrating Ukraine into NATO, even giving them an enhanced program for NATO membership. This is deemed duplicated by the United States and Taiwan. Furthermore, the United States is carrying out a program in official terminology to encircle China with a ring of sentinel states armed with advanced precision weapons provided by the United States aimed at China. The ring is South Korea, Japan, Australia, American protectorates, Guam, and so on, backed by major naval maneuvers in the Pacific, the RIMPAC maneuvers aimed at China. The United States for the first time has established establishing permanent nuclear capable B-52 bases in Guam and uh, Northern Australia, Darwin, Australia. Uh, flight uh, can reach China from there providing Australia, Britain and the United States, providing Australia with nuclear submarines to operate in the South China Sea. Uh, all of these are, and in addition to this, the United States has declared what the business press actually accurately calls war, economic war against China to try to prevent China from developing technologically for a generation putting great pressure on European, South Korean, Japanese industries to stop providing China with the means to develop its economy. What is the threat of uh, China at this point? Um, the threat is coming from the United States with, of course, Britain following it. It's just a lackey at this point. It's not an independent country anymore. But uh, Britain, the United States and its British lackey are provoking China openly now. Well, is China a saintly country? Of course not. China's violating international law in the South China Sea by 
fortifying some rocks that are disputed, uh, doing other things. It's not a nice place. But if you look at the talk about Taiwan, it's coming from the West. Yes, China is when the United States carries out some provocative act like House Speaker visiting Taiwan. China carried out uh, naval activities demonstrating that it can blockade Taiwan. It was in reaction to the visit. Another symbolic visits are taking place now. Could it explode? Could, yeah. Uh, so far, there's nothing on the Chinese side, but could happen if you keep provoking it, could explode. So yes, there's a threat of war there. Is it ever right for the United States to provide weapons to democracies under threat of invasion by dictatorships? Like Saudi Arabia, for example, where Britain and the United States are happy to pour arms into the one, one of the most uh, harsh dictatorships in the world, which is furthermore carrying out, has been carrying out military operations that killed about 350,000 people in Yemen. Yes, Britain and the United States are happy to do that if they can make money from it. All right, Noam Chomsky, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, where we release videos every week.